yeah, it's been an absolute privilege and pleasure to work with Judy over uh, many years now. So it's been very, very exciting to make new findings in autism and in um, the immune system in autism. So, um, and thank you again for the Brain Foundation for allowing me to, to, to speak and uh, for Pramila for the invitation. So it's a real honor to be here and to, to um, discuss some of my work. So I think in the next 20, 25 minutes, um, we will uh, I'll try and present some of the some of the findings that we have on um, in the immune function in in, in um, children with autism that have gastrointestinal comorbidities. So this was something that um, has you know was shown twenty years ago or even longer, but it's taken a while for it to really gain a lot of traction now uh, until recently. And I think now everybody's really seeing this GI issues as a, as a major comorbidity. I mean, to, to me, it's probably about 50% of the children that we see have some sort of GI issue. And that's a lot higher than in the general population. Anyway, what, what I hope um, from this presentation is uh, that I can maybe bridge the gap between some of the things that were talked about on um, last week, which was an, uh, which I thought was an excellent session, hearing from from a lot of different people about genetics and about um, maternal immune activation, about animal models, and then bridging that gap, maybe talk, and then starting to elaborate a little bit more on GI issues, immune issues, and then hopefully. That will then help um, project to further sessions where they're talking about GI issues and talking about immune biomarkers and things like that. So uh, hopefully this will this will help in that introduction. I think we really heard a lot of very interesting stuff from a number of the speakers last last week about the genetic components to autism. That this may be. 10 to 20 percent of of a risk of risk factors for autism what struck me and again it's you know a lot of this is all how how i see things or my bias towards things or you know just how i have different people might interpret things but i like the idea of 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 this the common gene um factors that maybe a lot of us share but somehow that those gene factors have to meet up with an environmental factor and that environmental factor then uh, leads on to um, having a diagnosis with 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 autism and also could interact and bring up things like comorbidities such as uh, innate uh, such as immune dysfunction or gi dysfunction and so you know that was that was really interesting and it's and again you could also look at certain things like environmental factors in the common versus the rare so there may be rare toxicants or pesticides that you you see but we all are exposed to air pollutants at, at, at a certain level especially those of us who live in California and in, in the in the valley in California, there's a lot of wildfire smoke. There's a lot of um, air pollution just from the industry and things like that. So we're all exposed to a number of these things, and that seems to be high risk factors for for um, um, for autism as well. Diesel fumes from cars and things like that. So you know you can maybe think of environmental factors in the same way as as, as uh, genetic factors were being discussed as common and rare. And you know, as an immunologist, we're interested in 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 in, in things that could uh, start the immune function or um, you know initiate immune responses and things like infections. They've been linked to to uh, autism risk, and you know the animal models that we heard quite a bit about were were maternal immune activation models with an infection. That in those cases a viral infection, but the the link in autism is is probably stronger for bacterial infections that may fire things up in a different way, and also we, there's this new emergence that maternal asthma or maternal allergies during pregnancy can have a big risk as well and so you know this is, is coming to the fore so uh, you know there's an interaction but I, I, again I, I often start this uh, these sort of presentations by saying 
you've got to, we've got to remember that the immune response is is important and it's good for us and it protects us from infections i mean i don't really need to say too much about that because you know we're all going through this time of covid and it's you know it's important to have a good and appropriate i guess that's the word appropriate immune response to help us protect us from these infections and to eliminate the infection and this this castle down at the bottom is from a book called How the Body Works. And it's really, I, I, it's how I became very interested in biology and medicine and, 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 and how, you know, as a young, I think it was 10 or 11 when I first book, saw this book about how, you know, you defend yourself and your body defends yourself with various things. You can maybe see at the bottom there, you got things that the body produces to protect the barrier. You've got a, a barrier of like the skin or the intestinal lining that protects infections from coming into the body. And then you have these sort of uh, white blood cells that help protect against particular sort of pathogens in anyway, it but it, it got me interested and that's that's um i you know but the point is that we need a good immune response and that's i think how judy and i have uh, sort of look at these things it, it's 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 all about an appropriate level so when we and there's the sort of branches into when we're when you maybe talking about biomarkers in the future that sometimes some biomarkers are going to be out but other biomarkers are going to be down and it's all about always about this balance of what's appropriate and what's not and then how that might feed back into the nervous system and again if one thing is too low then that might have a corresponding effect in the nervous system and then that might affect behavior and we've definitely seen that certain immune responses will affect behavior and again you know to just look at thinking about covid a lot of people would would have heard reports about how COVID really affects behavior in, in, the, in the sense that you have fatigue and that's not necessarily the bacteria, for example, that's the, that's the, the immune response is, is causing you to have fatigue, it's causing social withdrawal, all sorts of things like that. And there's the long-term effects of it that, you know, you've heard about this long COVID and that's, you know, could lead to depression and other sort of, um, uh, uh, psychological issues along that further further down the line so and it's a based around the immune response rather than the particular particular virus because or bacteria because we've seen this for other infections and, and other sort of pandemics and endemics so you know that's just a background and to, to sort of give you some 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 sort of idea of of, of uh, some of the immune uh, issues and how they can interact and and affect behavior so yeah 20 years ago i started in this field i'd, I'd been looking at um gi issues and how environmental particulates could could cause inflammation and i started to become looking for a postdoc i was very interested in this idea that there could be an, some gi issues in autism and, and what that could could mean and you know at that time there wasn't a lot of information about gi issues but it was seeing that when we were talking to clinicians that a lot of, lot of kids were coming in who who did have autism and, and and severe gi problems and it wasn't really being uh diagnosed or treated or in any shape or form in terms of you know what what we could call established gi issues but Having said that, Kanner in his very first description of autism showed that I think it's like eight out of his original patients had some sort of GI issue or some sort of immune issue, and so that they were. It wasn't. It's not a. It's not necessarily a new idea that there's uh, GI issues, and other people over the years have shown that there's reduced glycosylation, there's changes in sulfation of, of different um, drugs and things like bacterial overgrowth happen. Um, you know, now we've got these high sequencing ways of looking at microbiome and things like that. But even back in 20 years ago, we, we were seeing that there was bacterial overgrowth just by doing cultures of, uh, you know, old school ways of looking at things, cultures of bacteria. And 
especially in sort of the oral um, uh, areas, the uh, esophageal, we were able to see cultures where we shouldn't have been able to see anything because things like the acid in your stomach should have, have killed those things off. So we saw a lot of differences. People have, have described permeability differences and positive effects when you change the diet. So, you know, um, it all comes down to I, again. I alluded to it. What? 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 How many? How many of these kids? How many kids do ha with autism have GI problems? And estimates vary, and they can be based on uh, on population studies, or they can be based on in clinic studies. And of course, there's different biases and recalls um, that that go on there. I would say that 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 it's it may be at least fifty percent, forty percent, fifty percent of children with autism have some sort of GI issues um, and that they, these are severe issues and in compared to the general population who two to three percent might have the, the same sort of GI issues so it's big it's 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 at least seven to eight times larger in the GI in, in the population of, of kids with autism and the main complaints again you know there's some controversy about this but the main complaints that I've always heard about, or, or, or you know, we've tried to report on things like constipation and diarrhea, or overflow diarrhea, where where there's an impaction of, of due to the constipation, and you get this this alternating uh, diarrhea problem, and the, as well as things like pain, bloating, and food sensitivities. But you you have a whole session where where there's going to be a lot more detail about those sort of things. But we've seen differences with IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, and food allergies as well. And it's also been linked with those those the individuals that do have GI issues have more anxiety. They have sleep disturbances and 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 sort of other sort of uh, comorbid behaviors, aggressive behaviors, irritability, and, and lethargy. And you can kind of understand all of that. If, you, if your gut is in, in pain, uh, you, you, you're going to have some responses. So I think, you know, finding out more about what's behind the GI issues are very important. And then from an immunologist point of view, you know, the immune system in the gut is the biggest immune system in the body. So there's more immune cells in your GI tract than there are in lymph nodes and in spleen and elsewhere in the body. So it's a very important reservoir for immune cells. And it's se separated only from the gut lumen here and then the body proper, if you like, where, where all these immune cells live and, and these things called pears patches and then the lamina propria here, it's only separated by one layer of epithelial cells. So it, it's very close to all of those bacteria. And as we heard from Dr. Masmanian, the amount of bacteria in this is more, there's more bacteria there than there are human cells in the body. So the potential for interactions is huge. And that's why I think, uh, you know, as an immunologist, looking at the GI function is, is very important. So again, going back, this is going to be a little bit of a memory, uh, you know, a history tour, and I hope it doesn't get too, too boring from that point. But, you know, my sort of career as we, as we go from 20 years ago to, to the stuff that we're trying to look at now. But in those early days, what we... What we found were some, as well as the, you know, some of the bacterial overgrowth work that we did, we found that there were looking at endoscopies in some of you might have seen these things that there were high levels of lymphoid follicles in the intestine. This is the colon and this is looking at it from a microscopic point of view. But in the in the endoscopy, these and so these things are are areas where lymphoid cells have grown and, and, and proliferated many, many, many times and lymph, lymph tissue grows. So there's an active sort of immune response going on. And just think when you have an infection, you know, your lymph nodes grow in your neck. I mean, people are always like poking at, looking at their neck to see what's happening. And that's because lymph tissue is, is expanding and the same is, is happening in the gut. It's expanding because it's responding to something. So we don't know what it's responding to, but potentially it could be microbacteria, inappropriate responses to, to, to the microbiome. Then looking at intestinal tissue, so this is taking a biopsy and then cutting it for pathology and then staining specifically for 
for different types of cells and the different types of cells shine up in the, in this blue dye and what you have in the in the in the in the, in the a, a tissue from a typically developing child that had constipation so a similar sort of symptom you have one or two or a few of these brown cells within the, what this is called the lamina propria and then it's maybe hard to see, but on this is the epithelial layer, so that barrier of epithelial cells. You've got a few immune cells in there. When you compare that to the to a child with autism, they've got huge amounts of these brown staining lymphoid cells that are in trying to protect you in the epithelial barrier, and more so, more of them within the lamina propria. Um, then so that was one technique where we can do things by just looking at a slide and looking at things by immunohistochemistry we can also take out tissue and then look throughout the tissue uh, with a technique called flow cytometry where you can put markers on a particular cell and then the cell you know you can run it through this laser and it will tell you whether it's fluorescing or not and then that we can use that as a, a kind of postcode to work out what type of cell that that is whether it's an immune cell or whether it's something else and in these in this data we found that in the small intestine for example in autism it's in yellow um i believe but i've got i've got a picture of everybody in the corner yeah uh, aut autism is in blue, sorry, for this picture, and then compared to uh, inflamed uh, tissue, and then uh, in this case, celiac disease, we found, and typical developing controls are in this clear uh, bar, you find, find that there's increase of CD8 cells, so CD3 cells, so this is uh, T cells, immune T cells, but this isn't necessarily as high as it is in the classic inflammatory conditions such as Crohn's disease and such as uh, celiac disease. Um, and also so in the lamina propria cells and in the epithelial cells. So it's much higher than in the typical developing controls compared to, um, uh, but and also similar or uh, to, to sort of um, these sort of uh, inflammatory bowel conditions. You know. There you go. So what, not only did we look, so first of all, that was just describing things that we found in the small intestine, but we've also looked in the colon, we've also looked in the stomach, and um, and, and, and various other areas within the gut, and everywhere we looked, we found the same sort of response. Increased numbers of immune cells had infiltrated into the gut, so they come from somewhere or they've gone in there, or they've or they've proliferated within within the immune tissue, based on uh, some sort of inflammatory um, signal or initiation. So the next question is: Okay, so all of those cells are coming into the gut that may be doing something that's interesting, but we, you know, are they themselves producing certain things, certain immune mediators that could cause inflammation? And one of those immune mediators uh, are called cytokines. So I'm trying not to be too immune heavy because there's a lot of terminology in, in, in immunology that is very, very confusing. It's, it's confusing to me and, and it is like learning a, a new language. But what I'll try and do is try and keep to the basic principles of, of what we're going to look at rather than, so rather than the specifics, and some of you might be interested in the specific cytokines that are being produced, but more so about whether it's causing inflammation or whether it's to do with regulation and control. So again, I'm always interested in the balance and what's, uh, what's an appropriate response. So here we're looking at what these cells are doing so what 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 are they what sort of cytokines are they producing so when we look at pro-inflammatory cytokines we found that um we found that uh there was an increase in this time autism is is in, in yellow and and the inflammatory condition crohn's disease this time is in red and the non-inflamed is in in blue what we found is that when it came to inflammatory cytokines, we had increase compared to typical developing controls in uh, some of the inflammatory mediators, but not it wasn't as high as the inflammatory conditions such as uh, IBD. But maybe more striking is that in IBD, in Crohn's disease, 
when you get this increase in uh, pro-inflammatory uh, responses, you get a sort of compensatory uh, cytokine release that's trying to balance it out. Maybe it's not doing a good job because you still got the inflammatory response, but you haven't, you, you, you know, you have some sort of balance. But when you look at kids with autism, they've got no, none of this balance. So, you know, it's, it's a level of inflammation with no balance. So it's really sort of skewed. And then when we looked at uh, cytokines that are involved in allergic responses, so food allergies, for example, we got higher levels of these uh, cytokines that are involved in um, allergic inflammation. Oh, sorry, didn't move it forward. Another thing we did notice was that when we look at the barrier again, so you, similar picture of, of a small intestine, lemon appropria, epithelial cells, that we found that there were antibodies that were binding to the epithelial layer and that these bindings, these antibodies were activating the immune response. And this is something called complement and that these, the, the, the two co-localized together. And what this data shows is that there may be autoantibodies directed specifically at the epithelial cells, and that that could be causing an immune response on those epithelial cells that could damage the epithelial cells and lead to um, the, the, the um, lead to autoimmune response and lead to sort of um, intestinal permeability, uh, increased intestinal permeability. So that was the work I did before moving to the to the states, and then since um, moving here, um, we sort of kept going with sort of looking at more. Initially, we looked at a lot of immune um, different disorders, and, and and Judy was very interested in autoimmunity. So we, we looked at a number of things together on on autoimmune responses, but we also um, came back to to look more on GI um, projects in in more recent years, um, mainly because of of, of 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 people like the Brain Foundation that are very interested in in funding these these issues. But before then, there were, there were not. It was difficult to maybe pursue things in that in that area. Anyway, what we've looked at, what we're looking at now is we've set up a project to look at the balance between immune responses in not all of that work that I discussed before was in it was in gut tissue and now we're looking at blood tissue and so is there a way of of, of being able to look in the blood in and in, in individuals with autism to see if there's biomarkers potentially that we could use to to help show that there were immune differences in in, in the GI group compared to the non-GI group and whether that could help in some 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 ways in biomarkers for the future for for help in diagnosis or or help in sort of treatment effects and things like that so and then we were also interested of course in this appropriate level of immune response or, or regulation so we saw on one side, we were interested in the dark side of the force. I know it's, I'm a Star Wars nerd, um, but we were looking at pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then on this side is all about regulation and the control of, of these immune responses. And so our hypothesis that was that, you know, the dark side would take over and you'd have all this inflammation as opposed to, to regulation. So what we did is we recruited a large number of children that had autism with GI symptoms. And these GI symptoms were, like I said before, constipation, regulation, uh, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain. And they had to have them frequently in the last three months. And, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and a number of these um, GI issues. Kids without GI issues never had GI issues and, and never said, uh, you know, at two time points, this was, this was, we'd, we'd, we were able to use a screen where we, we looked at two different time points a couple of years apart. Then we had typical developing children who did or didn't have GI issues. I will say we had a real difficulty recruiting anybody with, who was a typical developing control kid with GI issues, which again sort of shows you how big the, the, the issue is in autism compared to, to typical developing kids. So then we took the blood, we isolated um, immune cells and plasma, and then we looked at whether immune cells would do anything. So to me, 
plasma cytokines give you certain information, but it's always interesting to look at a cell and an immune cell and give it um, a stimulant to see if, what it does. You know, is it doing anything? And that helps sort of mimic more what might be going on in response to microbiome, for example, or response to a sort of infection. And then we looked, as I said, with this technique, flow cytometry, so we could sort of characterize and phenotype particular types of cells. <clears throat> and also we looked at behavioral data. So first of all, looking at behavioral data, we did see that there was a difference between those kids that had GI issues and those kids that didn't have GI issues in things like irritability, lethargy, and hyperactivity and so this was sort of known but it's it's nice of course to to sort of um confirm these findings and of course it shows again that you know maybe if you treat the gi issues you can you can moderate or modulate some of these um these 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 uh, things that are occurring <clears throat> so then when we did stimulation responses and this one is a response to lps lps is a bacterial byproduct so it's there's going to be plenty of lps in the gut itself because of all the bacteria and interestingly what we found is that most of the responders were those that were not gi kids um they were the asd with with no gi compared to um, the asd with gi and the typical developing controls and you know that may sort of it goes with some of the data that we've seen it may also be interesting for things like trained Im uh, immunity which um, i know dr yanuch is going to be talking about later and, and we're also very interested in but it, it seems that maybe these immune responses uh, are diff already different in and, and maybe this in a way can help with biomarkers and and, and and helping pinpoint different groups that might then help us with therapies and things like that but as well, more over than that, I'm going back. So with the pro-inflammatory cytokines that get produced, what we consistently saw in the ASD with GI group was this lack of a regulatory cytokine called transforming growth factor. And the, in every single test that we did, depending on the different types of stimulation and maybe don't get caught up with that too much, but they are, these two are different stimulants and they act in, in completely different way. But the overriding thing is a child with GI issues doesn't have this sort of regulation. So that was, that was kind of interesting that you starting to really see that, that again, and that goes back to the, the data when we looked at biopsies themselves, they have very little in regulation. So the control is, is different. And then moving on to looking at flow cytometry, we sort of, we you, you, there's various ways that you can look at different types of cells. There are cells called TH17 cells that are very important in things like dealing with fungus, dealing with um, out extracellular bacteria, and they've also been implicated in autoimmune disease. And then down on this level, you want to look at the regulatory T cells, and they're, they're the ones that are in control. So we're really interested in this, because this is, uh, you know, Sarkis, uh, in some of his work, had shown that TH17 cells were increased, and uh, T, uh, he didn't really look at Tregs, but TH17 were increased, and, 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 and you heard other talks about IL-17 and how that could be very important um, in, in, in autism and, or, or, and in, in sort of uh, psychiatric disorders in general. And then we, were, we, we looked, also looked at things that may be involved in allergy and um, sort of uh, cell mediated responses. So what we found, <clears throat> which was consistent with the TGF beta data, was that when you looked at cells that are involved in regulatory cell control, and, and again, I don't, you maybe not get too worried about the specifics, but these are thought to be some of the major cell types that are involved in control. Those kids with GI issues were much lower than, than, the, than the typical developing controls. But in reverse, when you're talking about things that are involved in pathogenic responses, we saw more TH17 cells than we'd in the kids with ASDGI compared to control. So the balance completely shifted. <clears throat> in, in the previous talks, we talk, people were talking about microbiome and how microbiome are important. And we're going to go to more talks about that. So I, I'm not going to 
dwell too much on that because they're the experts and I'm really not the experts in that in this but we took uh, stool samples and we ran the stool samples to look at different types of bacterial profiles and what most of the typical developing controls were in one group um, and some of the autism controls were in another group and it when you do pathway analysis you can pick out pathways where these the where these microbiome uh, biome has been linked to certain cellular process and we found cellular stress they were linked with um, kids with autism had microbiomes that were linked to cellular stress and also linked to um, uh, immune responses but what struck me is that the bacteria we were seeing were not really the same bacteria as everybody else has been reporting and I think when you look at the data it depends on where you are in geography, but maybe in the end, what's important is the pathways they do. In fact, so different bacteria may be different in Arizona, for example, to California, to, to, to you know, um, Europe. But, um, you know, maybe they all interact somehow on, on, on immune responses. So that's, I think, how, how, how looking at things in the future might might be important looking at those things in the future. So just for a conclusion of, of, of that part, and I'm just, just double checking time. Yeah, I've got a couple of minutes. Um, we found that autism has, you know, can be caused by, or oh, there's risk factors that are genetic, there's risk factors that are environment, and both of those together could affect the immune response. So, you know, oh, I didn't maybe- I just wanted to remind you that we want to leave time for questions. Sorry, I can chime yeah, in. Yeah, no, I mean, I did, I'm just getting there. Um, but anyway, the consistent theme is, is immune regulation. Um, Sorry, Judy, I, I always overrun. Um, anyway, our new hypothesis is also what's, what we see is very important is, these epi, is the epithelial layer. Not only does it protect from bacteria getting in, but it could also have effects on immune cells and, and, and signaling to immune cells and how they can get educated. So what we've done is we've started to set up from uh, a, studies where we can actually get epithelial tissue we've started to set up organoids so we're taking intestinal epithelial from actual patients uh, and 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 being able to look at how they might then go on to regulate the immune responses and also their cellular stress and their oxidative stress linking into future talks later so the models are we can take the epithelial cells out grow them in a dish and they'll form these 3D and 2D structures that you could then uh, apply on the cell surface, things like microbiome, um, bacteria, or other sort of uh, immune responses on the basolateral side and see what the interactions between the two. So the Brain Foundation has, uh, has, has is funding this work and we've managed to even through COVID managed to take a, uh, um, organoids create eight organoids from from human patients as well as a number of uh genetic and environmental um uh, uh, uh models if you like of autism or or, or ha that have autism like behaviors so what we're really looking for in the future is whether we can use these organoids you know that's the ideal is somehow we would be able to grow them out and and, and help transplant them back but we're looking at genex analysis of these organoids we're going to look at um, uh, whether they have cellular stress uh, or, or don't have cellular stress and how they interact with the immune cells that we've also got from the same patient so what the benefit of this is it's not in an animal it's in a human it's from a human which from an individual that has those gi issues and has autism and we can look at microbiome and um also other sort of factors that could affect uh, autism. So, yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a rush at the end, but you know, it's exciting what we, we can do. Thank you very much for the Brain Foundation for funding some of that initial uh, initial study. Uh, thank you for all my collaborators, especially Judy, which, you know, we, we've worked together for, for many years and, and had um, many happy co collaborations over that time. And um, thank you, thank you for listening. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so we went a bit over there. Um, I know, I, I was gonna, I knew it. <laughs> um, so somebody asked if, um, can patients enroll in the, 
the study that you've got going now, the organoid study? Uh, I think if you live within our catchment areas, which are the same as uh, the charge, so within the Bay areas, then then yeah, then yes, I think so. Bay area and Sacramento area. Yeah. Okay. And then um, what kind of correlation? So I think you talked about this in your talk, the correlation that you would expect to see between mucosal and GI cytokines and per, in the and peripheral blood serum cytokines. Well, do you, uh, do you speak to that? Yeah, that's always a that's always a, a tricky question. I mean, what we what we're seeing in the blood has been very similar to GI tissue. So what we're doing at the moment is is doing exactly that. Is our what we see in the blood exactly the same as the, the mucosa? So we're actually we're, we are testing that out both at the protein level and also we'll be doing some gene expression data. So there's some ex, there's some data from things like Crohn's disease that you, it, it is the same cytokine. 